people say, well, who moves first getting us off the crazy cycle? And my response is, hone the tone. Am I coming across to her in a loving way? If not, it's going to be difficult. Even though she's hearing the issue, there's another issue going on. I can't believe you would talk to me so unlovingly. The issue to him is very important to you, but if you come across with the look, I know I'm coming across, that's not my aim here. You know, I'm not trying to step on your air hose. How do I say this in such a way that you don't think that I'm trying to show you disrespect? How do I say this in a way that doesn't sound unloving? Help me here. I always like to say when the issue isn't the issue, this is probably the issue. It's the root concern. I don't know how many people have said to me, well, you just said in 45 seconds explains 30 years of my marriage. Wow. I want love. I want respect. So joining me here in San Antonio, Texas, during our Escape the Matrix conference, back for the second time. This is Dr. Emerson Egridge here, the author of Love and Respect. And he just rocked our stage here and he finished off with a powerful prayer for our audience. For our audience. So uh, Dr. Emerson Egridge, thank you for being here once again. I'm excited. And as you said, that group is <laughs> unique. I'm very blessed. So thank you, Matt and Sheena. Thank you for uh, this uh, time together. Absolutely. And thank you for being available during COVID when it was a weird time. No. And the the motivation for us to get on on Zoom was because husbands and wives were locked in at home. Yes. And some conflict was starting to happen because they're no longer, you know, going to their, you know, their safe space yes. at work. Yes. And a lot of those clips went, went viral, as we talked about earlier. So, um, you know, you were, you were talking about, um, you know, you were talking about uh, in your book, The Crazy Cycle, in terms of arguments. Because my wife and I, we work in business together. And sometimes, as much as we consciously know about the crazy cycle, we still end up in it. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, I wrote the book and Sarah and I get on it. Okay. But what is the crazy cycle? Maybe you can highlight that. Yeah. Well, can you, can you unpack for, for people that's watching yeah, this for the first mean, time? Yeah. Uh, the University of Washington studied 2,000 couples for 20 years, and they said the two basic ingredients for a successful marriage is love and respect. Well, interestingly, the Apostle Paul said, that 2,000 years ago in Ephesians 5.33, that a husband is to love his wife and a wife is to respect her husband. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've concluded that she needs respect and he needs love. There isn't a debate there, but usually in the felt need conflict, even as the both of you kind of said, I want respect, I want love. Uh, I've asked 7,000 people this question. When you're in a conflict with your spouse, do you feel unloved at that moment or disrespected? Open-ended question based on the University of Washington's finding of those two key ingredients. And uh, 83% of the men said they feel disrespected. Mm. And that's because, again, we usually are very assured of our wives' love. I mean, yeah. women truly are virtuous, nurturing, loving, caring at that intimate level. We don't usually feel that they don't love us unless they've said, I sure. don't love you anymore. Yeah. Um, and But that's, that's a deal breaker in many ways for her. But uh, uh, they, the women on the other side, 72% said they feel unloved. So not every woman feels unloved, not every man feels disrespected, but given that that's kind of a, well, and it is statistically significant, it shows us our leanings. And even if we're reversed, it doesn't really make any difference. I always say, if the shoe fits, where is it? But here's what I discovered, the crazy cycle. When a wife feels unloved, she tends to react in a way that feels disrespectful to him. That's not her intent. Mm. That's how it appears. And sometimes she will say that she doesn't respect him. Um, and then on the other side, when he feels disrespected, he tends to react in a way that feels unloving to her. Right. He doesn't intend to, or he'd die for her, but he's coming across that way, maybe drop it, forget it, I don't want to talk about it, walks away. Yep. But then that triggers what I call a crazy cycle. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love. Without love, she reacts without respect. And this baby spins out of control in some cases. And I always like to say, when the issue isn't the issue, this is probably the issue. It's the root concern. I don't know how many people have said to me, what you just said in 45 seconds explains 30 years of my marriage. Wow. Does that make sense? But that's un the crazy un unaddressed, thing. unaddressed and unarticulated. Yes. I mean, it puts a vocabulary, particularly, I think, the man and the woman, but men are kind of like, I'm supposed to suppress that feeling I have about being honored for who I am apart from my performance. He doesn't know how to talk that way. Yeah. It almost appears as though he's egotistical and narcissistic. Yeah. But men serve and die for honor. Mm. We give that's our right. very lives. Right. So no man among men, when he honors another man, would see the other guy as egotistical. Right. We actually know he'll soften, he will respond, he will serve. But women have not really heard this message. And so they're a little apprehensive 
and understandably so, that I'm going to feed something that I don't think needs to be fed. And, yep. and if he would just love me, I think everything would be okay. And yep. she's very innocent in that perspective until she has boys. Mm -hmm. And when she has sons, then she begins to be a little bit more open because yep. she notices from age four on, there's a little bit of a difference in him. Yep. And she wants to connect with that boy, but it's not working. That's why I wrote the book, Mother and Son, called The Respect Effect and how she can motivate her boy actually to move toward her, to connect in the same way that she longs to connect with her husband. You know, there's a lot of stats that are showing that more people today aren't going to church. Uh, was it 1962, 1963, they, they removed the Bible from schools. More people today are single parents. More people today are getting divorced. A lot of men aren't seeing the incentive to getting married because why build this all up just to 50% of it divide and have to start all over from scratch and she gets everything that I work for. And so the unfairness of the legal system when it comes to, to, to marriage, so why get married? And there's also a lot of shows out there, podcast videos of men talking amongst other men but how awesome it is to stay single. And women amongst women, how awesome to be a strong and independent. So can we talk a little bit about some of the social issues that's going on today? For, for example, the feminism side says, listen, I'm a strong and independent woman. I don't need a man. I can get child support, pa 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 pa. And that's why, you know, you get celebrities like Tyrese complaining and, you know, no child needs $30,000 a month, you know, that type of dialogue. They also flipped all the way on the other side. Red pill is, hey, I'm a man. I make all the money. She needs to stay home, raise the kids. I can have as many women as I want, et cetera. Can you address some of that from more of a faith-based perspective, from a, from a biblical standpoint? Well, I think my own upbringing, uh, we were not a Christian family. I mean, I didn't know, uh, you know, I suppose there was that undercurrent in my early upbringing on the Judeo-Christian worldview and then that, that idea, but we didn't go to church basically. And so and I know in my own heart, there was a search. Why am I here? You know, what happens after death? I mean, these are questions I personally asked. And I think almost everybody does. And so each of us has to kind of come to grips with what do I believe and why do I believe that? For me, it was really my encounter with Christ himself and believing that he was more than a carpenter, as we say, that uh, he claimed to be the son of God. I believe that. I believe that Jesus Christ claimed that about himself. Then I had to settle in my own mind, was he accurate in that self-assessment? And I came to a point where I believe he was accurate in that self-assessment. So then at an early age, I began to say, I want to align my thinking with that of Christ who says God made us male and female. God made us to be married if we don't have the gift of celibacy, that we can't be a eunuch for the kingdom. Then God designed me to be in a monogamous relationship with, you know, whether one man, one woman, and Jesus Christ teaches that. And I had to settle whether I believed that or not, but I came to a point where I did. So now we're up against a culture, as you said, the church attendance issues and all the dynamics that you've said. People are saying, I don't know if I believe that, or some are saying overtly, I don't believe that. But I think that all of us, I have a healthy self-interest. Mm -hmm. And I think the man who says, you know, I'll have a woman and I can sleep around. I've not met a woman yet who's married to that man who will sign off on that. <laughs> I, not in terms of her deepest heart. Now, if he's making a million dollars a year and she can spend anything she wants and, and he can go out and do whatever, but that's short-lived. Uh, God did not hardwire I mean, I just say to that guy, if he's got a sister, his own grandmother, his own mother, I mean, is that how they're wired to live that way? Mm. Uh, and so then he has to ask himself whether he's aligned with how a woman would really yeah. process. Yeah. And it does that matter to him? If it does matter to him, then probably what will happen is those people will exit. And when he's 87, he will be in a retirement center, perhaps have an early onslaught of a dementia. He will be so depressed, so despondent, so lonely, so alone, so rejected. And I say to such individuals, let's kind of see the end from the beginning, not just in business. You begin with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. Let's take your life and look where this is going to go. And just trust me here. I'm not trying to shame you. This is not going to end well for you. Hmm. Hmm. And on the other side, where you have the feminists, much of that has been rooted in fear. That in, in both of these, by the way, are economic models of, of, a, of, of, a, of a worldview that you make your life choices based on economy. On, on, so the feminist movement is rooted in the only way we're going to have equality is if we make as much money as men. Sure. And then they came up against the problem of children. So then the issue of abortion became centered piece as well as daycare because you've got to prevent children from interfering with their career, which economically allow her to wow. make the kind of money that makes it ultimately that we can have a healthy relationship. But it doesn't happen, does it? See what I'm saying? Yes, yes. So too, and this guy out there, well, I got all this money. I can do whatever I want with it. And so, well, that's, you're, you're making your decision based on your ability to buy your happiness. 
And if you lose the money, then what? You know, in other words, is there something deeper that contributes to an inner contentment, inner peace, inner satisfaction? And most of us, I've got my PhD in family studies and the research would point out that if you just pay attention to the people who have lived that way, there is later regret. Even the strong and independent expression, oftentimes that's stated because I don't feel strong and I don't feel independent. And those who subscribe, I need a, a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Even the person who proposed that ended up married later in life, she did. And so there is, I think, a recognition that it's okay to, to love one person, to have that companionship, and you're not somehow going to be the worst for the wear of that. And certainly my view is Jesus would say that's the right way to go. And if you don't go that way, it's probably not going to end in your own happiness. And then you have to decide, do I have enough healthy self-interest that I'm willing to confront my own short-term goals to think bigger scheme here? So, well, my friend, Bob, powerful, powerful answer. Thank you. Uh, sure, I know you got some questions. You got some things that uh, you want to get off your chest. I mean, because we're both... Okay, this might turn into a mini counseling session. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're both alpha in our in our ambition. Yes. Alpha in our disposition. Alpha in our competitive nature. Um, and sometimes with that, and by the way, that's that, so what I love about her. And uh, so, but at the same time, too, as well, that can potentially come with, with conflict. So how do we have a healthy alpha type energy when it comes to goals, when it comes to what's best for our family? What should be the proper order of, of going about our decisions in our relationship? Well, I might, we use the word alpha, but it could very well be that you both have the spiritual gifts. There are 19 spiritual gifts that the Bible talks about, one of which is leadership. So okay. let's just suppose both of you have been gifted by God, endowed yes. by God with the gift of leadership, if not secondarily, maybe administration. Those are two gifts, the gift of leads, the gift of administration. So how does that husband... Administration is not my gift. Yeah, so leadership yeah. is your gift. <laughs> it is more your... Oh, yeah. you, you, but she's also a leader. Uh, administrator, leader, leader, not administrator. But nonetheless, leadership, let's yeah. suppose you both have the gift of leadership. Mm -hmm. There's going to be that tension. Or um, if you're more the administrator, you see the the gaps that he continues to allow. He's got the vision, he's off running. Fair then he, then you're, you're finally picking up the pieces. You're doing all the filling the blanks. And now he's off on another vision. <laughs> okay. So you got a temperament issue. He may be more sanguine. You may be a little more... I know phlegmatic, I don't know how you view your assessment, but nonetheless, profiling is a beautiful thing. If we see the strengths of this, mm -hmm. and so I, already I'm going to tell you, you both are 80% of the way there because they're the issue of awareness. Okay. And people who are unaware of these yeah. dynamics, that's a whole new, they need yeah. to have that illumination, but you are already there. So now you're really wanting to tweak it and you're using me at free expense to accomplish that. <laughs> Just kidding. Squeezing it in there. <laughs> right. Slide in there. So, I mean, I think, you are, you're going to do well, but then it comes down to this issue of how do we both have different ideas and opinions on something? We have honest differences of opinion. Yep. We have strong feelings about it. We even have maybe some convictions on that. Mm -hmm. Romans 14 talks about uh, that we have different convictions at times. It doesn't mean that the conviction is something God has said, thus saith the Lord. It was like eating meat versus not eating mm -hmm. meat, this holy day versus that holy day. And the context there is the Jews didn't eat meat. Gentiles did. Now they're one in Christ. They were free to eat meat, but the Jews said, my conscience and conviction doesn't let me eat meat because of the upbringing issues. Mm, okay. And the holy day was worshiping on Sunday, the resurrection day, but the Jews who came to Christ still had Sabbath on Friday night. Wow. That became a major conflict in the early church. We don't appreciate it, but if we can get back at that moment and Paul says, quit judging each other with contempt, you have different convictions. And what he's saying is, you're going to have to come together on this. There's a way you can figure this out. Yeah. And so the challenge isn't to say that one of us needs to go the other way. It's a matter of how do we come up with what I call the third option, the creative alternative? How do we find win-win? And uh, there was a, a beautiful show called uh, Designing for the Sexes. And he was an interior designer. And he had a woman that wanted all traditional interior. The husband wanted all contemporary. And I'm looking and said, this isn't going to come together. They're going to fight. So what he did, he knew exactly where to go with this. He created one room, all traditional but then he had a contemporary piece accented in light. What that did by contrast caused the traditional to pop. Mm. And the husband loved it because the traditional, or she, the, she loved the traditional. It just, I, which I, I forget which I said, who was traditional. She was traditional. He was, he was more contemporary. So the traditional, she loved the traditional and uh, he liked that centerpiece. They loved it. Then he did the same in the other room with all contemporary and put a traditional piece with light on it. Yeah. And the contemporary 
was accented and contrasted and just popped. Yeah. And, and the traditional was the centerpiece. And so my point to people is at first we think it's impossible. You're not going to bring a traditionalist and a contemporary together in a tear design. He did it. Two alphas might think, you know what? We're just too bullheaded. We have too strong of convictions. That is something that I would say is only going to result in a better decision. And even, and this is what I say to people, we think if I get my way 100%, I'm going to be happy. There's no way that we could somehow compromise and I get 80%, she gets 20% or vice versa. Well, in that room, 20% went to the contemporary or the traditional, but they ended up feeling happier than if they'd gotten their own way. Wow. And the goal then always is there a third option here that we actually are going to be happier than if we got only our way, even though we're getting less of what we originally thought we wanted. And I challenge people that you can and God intends us. This is what oneness is all about. This is why we talked in the group about you each have authority in the bedroom. Well, who yeah. makes a decision about sexual intimacy? The answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> and how do we come together on that? God intends for two people of goodwill to discern that. And this is what I found over my years of experience. People don't ask the Lord to help them. They don't ever just say on the heated fellowship moment, Lord, look, she did so both went away. <laughs> and uh, just help us in this. We give you some time, speak to our heart, illuminate us a little bit, bring some wise counselors, help us on this. Find this third option here that is going to actually make both of us happier. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But more often it will, particularly if it's creating a divisiveness between the two. Wow. At the same time, you say, hey, that's your lane. It's not really my lane. That's your wheelhouse. That's not mine. Sometimes there is a division of labor just based on experience and expertise. But given there's an honest stalemate between, yeah. you know, we both have the strength, the wisdom, yeah. the yeah. Then, then the way I'm suggesting does work. It just does. But people don't have the patience. I got to get on with this right now. And two alphas don't have patience. I have more patience. But I, you know, it's interesting. Um, us being married, I redefine what conflict is. Because like conflict, you're like, oh, you're disagreeing. But now I realize, no, conflict is just your perspective is different from mine. Beautiful. So, Beautiful. And Beautiful. So, yeah, that's how I look at it yes. now. So I'm like, okay, well, how do I communicate my perspective in a way that it's received in a healthy way? Which yes. is, okay, now I have to study you. I have to study you to figure out who you are because I've been communicating to you based off my perspective of me. Yes. And this is how I am. And which yes. most, most women are, we're just very like direct and straight to the point. But I just felt like my directness was being received as disrespect. Yes, yes. And then we weren't winning. That's right. That's right. So, well, we can, it's tone. Well, oftentimes it's tone. And in disagreement can be interpreted as disapproval of who I am. It's 100% tone. You yeah, you're, 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 you're nailed it. And that's why we have yeah. to then back. Is, I don't want to say this disrespectfully. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to argue with you. If my tone gets out of, you know, because Aaron and I said we can be right, but wrong at the top of our voice. And so it's important. And I did, I have this 15 day plan. The first one is hone the tone. The very first point, hone the tone. Am I coming across to her in a loving way? If not, it's going to be difficult. Even though she's hearing the issue, there's another issue going on. I can't believe you would talk to me so unlovingly. Mm. And the same thing, you know, the issue to him is very important to you. But if you come across with the look, you know, with the men and, and the hand on the hips and the, you know, right. all of these are gestures of contempt. And so he's not going to hear. Right. So what we have to do is not necessarily stop that, but to say, look, I know I'm coming across. That's not my aim here. You know, I'm not trying to step on your air hose. How do I say this in such a way that you don't think that I'm trying to show you disrespect? How do I say this in a way that doesn't sound unloving? Help me here. Mm. Appeal to the other person for help. Yeah. And usually that softens them, particularly if they were feeling that yeah. you, in fact, were intending to be unloving or disrespectful or at least didn't care. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Emerson, you know, oftentimes, you know, as a man, when you do get in these, what do you call that, heated fellowship. Yes. Heat, that's funny, not arguments, heated fellowship. <laughs> these moments, like, we're getting in a fight. And then I go to my business. I'm in a fight with my business there, too. Yes. And then over. in my kids, my, 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 my children, there's another fight there. And then just something's going on, that, like, some days I just feel like, can I just get a freaking win today? Why is it always an L? And who do I go to? How do I, how do I talk about this type of stuff? Sure, I pray. Sure, I associate with other men. But at the same time, too, as well, I can't talk to her because I don't want to show my level of weakness to my wife. So how do I, how do I get a win? How, how do you help me through that? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I certainly see how it spills over. I had some medical doctors, friends, they said they're in the 
locker room getting ready for the early surgery, right? And the surgeon going into the room first comes slamming the door, slamming the locker. He had a huge fight with his wife and they all knew it. And all of them say, I'm glad I'm not on that table this morning. Oh. <laughs> so it, it has a tremendous yes. adverse, yeah. unintended consequence. Uh -huh. It's not healthy. But it, I'd have to know more about the specific to get a win. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, you're assuming that you're losing. And sometimes we do. We, we assume that because there's a tension or conflict or they didn't agree that I'm losing on this and I need to feel good about myself. But I would say in your case, you're just too smart. You're too successful. So how do we not allow whatever that negative thing happened to affect your self-image? How do we maintain an inner peace in the midst of, of an unresolved conflict, let's say? So, but I don't know if I was hearing you correctly. So I don't know the frame of reference because in one sense, my first thought, why would you conclude from this that you're a loser? What I heard you first say, my anger or my upset spills over on my other relationships. And I thought you were going that way. It was that you too. Turned, it's hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. But, but then you turned and said, but I, I need a win. And I didn't know if that was the question. I guess that's the way I interpret it. Interpret what? Arguments or anger. As a loss. As a loss. Yes. Yes. Well, and I think that would be interesting for you to, and I th most of us do. Most of us feel that a message is being sent to us. If they don't agree with us, it comes back. They disapprove that we haven't done something right, that we are a loser, that we are failing. And uh, we read into these situations. I mean, because I'm a, a communication type person, I mean, I will read into Sarah's comments, meanings that aren't there. And she'll do it toward me too, but I'm, I'm really good at that. And so it's important for us not to misread a situation and if we misread it and then get upset because of it, we do ourselves no favor. Can I ask, because on that, like you, you mentioned, like the crazy cycle. Right. So love that book, Love and Respect. I recommend everyone read that book. Um, but I, I felt it. And maybe this is where husband and wife should never keep a tally on who's winning because I mean, <laughs> um, I'm always the one that <laughs> is giving in, that gives in or mm -hmm. it's the one that, um, make amends when there's a conflict. Right. Like, I'm always right. the one. And I used to think that way. And then I realized, well, maybe that's why I was picked or maybe that's why I was designed the way that I was designed for this particular person. And my, that's how I think with him. And so I noticed as the longer we are married, I used to, when there's a conflict, I would internalize it. And then it just felt like we just kept going back and forth. Like you mentioned, he didn't feel respected. I didn't feel love. It was just like a stubbornness of we're going to stand strong until, but it never really wins. And then there's always the one person, which maybe that's what I feel people need to hear. They're waiting on the other person to make the move to say, hey, how do we st stop the cycle? Can you kind of describe that? Because I feel sometimes people might interpret that as either a weakness or that you're losing or that you're you're overly submissive when you decide to be the person that stops the cycle versus the opposite, which is that strength in being the person that stops the cycle and embrace it and stay there because it's really healthy. It's good, right. Right? Yeah. Well, in that crazy cycle, without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love and it spins. And so people say, well, who moves first getting us off the crazy cycle? And my response is the one who sees himself or herself as the most mature. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, and, and, and everybody laughs at that point, but it's also true. And, and well, and then I say, and you know, you are the mature one because you see their behavior is childish. So you are the mature one. And so you move first. But I think the question then is, well, if I move first, what are we, how do we do that? But then I think there was another question we were asking earlier. And that was, I, I think I'm the one that always apologize. I'm trying to make amends. I'm trying to repair. And it doesn't seem that, that he is doing that as much as me. And that's not, uh, um, uh, something uncommon to the female. Mm -hmm. Deborah Tan has done research. Women will say, I'm sorry. That's just part of your, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right. There's a, it's an apology, but it's also an, I sorrow with you. Mm -hmm. If you, if you get into something, women, everywhere you go, they say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's within your nature. And it's a powerful thing. And when women suddenly realize it about themselves, but then they're also coached not to say sorry or not allow for interruptions. There's a lot of research out there that tells them to be more like a man. Um, but the, mm -hmm. the idea here is, why is it that I'm the one that's always apologizing? And, and it is important for man to humbly come back. And I coach men on doing that because as I even said to the group, it just, something is released. There's a power there and it's just something very powerful in her heart. And then she wants to move toward him to respond to him and his needs. But many men don't understand that. So on that side, I say to every man, don't be afraid of that. But I also say a lot of times he's not trying to be unloving. He was trying to do the honorable thing. 
but I didn't want to drop it, forget it. If you see how men are with men, and if Matt was with some of his buddies, and there was a little bit of a flare up of disagreements, they're not all going to say, let's huddle together and apologize for how we just came across to each other. What you'll see is more of an independence, what you'll see more is an independence, but then the guys feel badly about what happened. Mm. So what will happen is there will be some gesture of honor, mm. some gesture of service. They will do something to change the, the atmosphere, but it's usually an act. It's like I say to women, you know, you want him to say, I'm sorry, but if you said, you know, I, I, I seek your forgiveness for having come across disrespectfully to you, you're an honorable man who would die for me. I was out of line for that. And she's hoping that he would meet her halfway in reciprocity, we call it. She scratches his back, he'll scratch her back, but he doesn't. Instead, he just says, well, thanks, you know, and goes off. Well, this just drives some women through the roof. I said, okay, let's just wait. He's not, and women are expressive, responsive. So in that, they're going to get, men or not, we're more compartmentalized. But I said, now let's just give it several hours. And then I want you to write me back. You're not seeing it. You won't see what I'm saying until I have it. Look for a gesture of love. Tell me, was there some gesture that he did something that got your attention? He always does, yeah. Who? He does a gesture. Oh, there, there, that's what I'm saying. Um, and you've gotten ahead of me then on that. And so, but yeah, the women always write back. Yes, I said, trust me, this is our male way of expressing, I'm sorry, are we good to go? Or are we friends again? And, but so for some women, that's not good enough. Yeah, and I feel bad. Yes, sorry. Yes, and I, so she I says, badly. So, so we're okay, we're okay now? So we're okay now. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And this is where we have to meet each other halfway. As I just said, a man needs to give her that gift and realize the strength he has in saying, I'm really, I am sorry. Will you forgive me of that? And being authentic. And then can we have sex now? <laughs> you say, Correct. Stay away from that. Yeah, okay, stay away from 30 minutes. But genuinely seek that forgiveness and meet. But I say to women, there's another side to this. And your sons are going to be the same way. And do you want this wife that he marries just to be all over him mm -hmm. as a man who never makes amends when he's making amends in his world, right and left. There's a gesture in his way of saying, is everything okay? I like you. Mm -hmm. Do you like me? And it's my way of saying, thank you. Mm -hmm. But um, I just have gone on record by saying, let's meet each other halfway. Technically, I'm not going to defend either's position absolutely unequivocally. Mm -hmm. He needs to move that way, but she needs to move that way because we're made male and female. In God's eyes, mm -hmm. we are equal in that sense. So let's mutually serve each other. Mm. It may not feel fair, but it really is. You brought up a good point too. You have two boys and I can probably directly correlate my change to as they got older and my relationship with him because that's exactly what I was thinking. Yes. Mothers adore their boys and, um, and they're trying to process that. They don't necessarily adore their husbands, <laughs> but then they realize he is somebody's son. Mm -hmm. And then it, it does. It, this is when I wrote the book, Mother and Son. Yes. And the reason I wrote it, because we did the conference with husbands and wives and how giving your husband the gift of unconditional respect, talk respectfully to him as you confront things that are unlovable or not respectable mm. and do so to honor him. So I'm, not, I'm not trying to put you down here. You're an honorable man. Help me understand how you acted this way because it hurt me, but I'm not trying to say you're not an honorable man and I'm not trying to dishonor you. I have a need that only you can meet. Coach me here. Okay. So as women began to do that, then they also had these boys in the home. They said, well, he's a man. I wonder why I can't do it with my, say to my, I've had the psychologist say to her four-year-old boy, I really respect you. And she's like, I knew that'd be too abstract. He wouldn't, he wouldn't even understand. Mm -hmm. He just stood tall. She said, thanks, mom. Mm -hmm. Just as I said, well, if a, a father says to her four-year-old little girl, I love you. Right. She intuitively understands that. Right. Love is still in some ways abstract, mm -hmm. but we don't believe that. We only believe that the stuff about the males is Neanderthal. And that's mm -hmm. not at all. He, he got that. So what happened is these mothers, of four-year-olds, of 14-year-olds, of 24-year-olds, of 40-year-olds mm -hmm. began to apply this to their sons and were blown away with the conversations. The boys were now calling the adult sons, the 16-year-old boy. She said, for the life of me, I, you're an honorable boy. I don't understand how you, an honorable young man, will not make your bed. I've asked you three times this week. And when she introduced the respect talk and appeal to honor, she said he went right up and made his bed. And these things began to happen and the women began to write me. Mm. You're not going to believe this, Dr. Emerson. So that book, Mother and Son, is story after wow. story after story of mothers telling me what happened with their four-year-olds and with their 40-year-olds. Oh, what a great book. Oh, that's so... Wow. Well, Focus on the Family interviewed me on this, and Jim Daly and John Fuller were friends, and, and they were so excited about this, they divided the 
the radio thing up in five minute sections and put a course together. And I was just about to launch this major mother and son course mm. and they didn't know that. So they, they launched this five minute increments and a hundred thousand women signed up for it. Wow. And I said, to Jim, thanks. Just about to launch. So now I got to put that on hold. You gave away free what I was going to ask people to make an investment in. Wow. Yeah, that's why I often feel sometimes that uh, society today, the culture we have today, it's it's overmothered and underfathered. Yep. Mm. And you're just nailing it because a lot of men, for the most part, I don't. I'm 12 years older there, but I feel in many areas he's very more mature, even though I'm older. Yes. Well, no, women have an emotional intelligence. Okay. They're nurturing in the birth process. Chemicals flood the female, in some cases, 400% more than the, the male and so the intuition, the nurturing, the caring, all the research points out the caregiver. So women have this natural caring on the intimate level. They, they, they move into intimacy. They're not afraid of it as much. They, they can't not look at the eyes. Mm -hmm. um, there's just a beauty that God has designed there. And so most of us men would feel like you feel, but they just seem to be on top of this so much more than we are. Mm -hmm. But what we have to recognize is the identity of the children rests totally on the dad's view of them. Wow. And that men are not stupid. They just do things differently. Now, yeah. we're not talking about violence. Sure. We're not right. talking about that. But he's not going to be as as sensitive as you are. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that he's necessarily wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I challenge us. We're a team in this. And that if we are both the adults in the room, we're principle driven and uh, we are, you know, not losing control, then you need to really let him speak into this. But mm -hmm. today, particularly with the blended family, and the, the bloodline issues, this becomes a war. Right. And then they don't divorce the second time because everybody would know then that they're a loser. Mm. But now in some ways they're unhappier in the second relationship mm. than they were in the first because of the conflicts, let's say, of his fathering. And you don't talk to my children this way. Well, if he's evil, no, mm. but maybe he's right. Maybe he's just right. You know, I have the story when I was in fifth grade, I was overweight. And it was fifth grade. We we're inside. I remember Danny was his name and Debbie. Debbie was the cutest girl in the class. And uh, we were, the three of us were standing there. And Danny says to me, my nickname was Eddie. Eddie, you are fat. Wow. In fifth grade. And Debbie met him. It was her name at the time. She said, no, he's not Danny. And I looked at Debbie and Debbie looked at me and we both knew she just lied. <laughs> but here's what I thought about. She was kind, but untruthful. Hmm. Danny was truthful, but he wasn't kind. So, I mean, in the long scheme of things, sometimes fathers should be kinder, but it's not that they're untruthful. Mm. And, and we need to allow maybe a little bit more for the Dannys rather than just dump on them. <laughs> and, and I mean, Danny was a fifth grader. Yeah. And I don't think that fathers overall are that unkind, but sometimes they may be a little bit more candid, a little bit more disciplinarian. Yeah. We had fathers who disciplined and we respected them for it, Hebrews says. So I challenge couples to see that both of you are necessary. And in the long run, in the, he can't nurse. In the early years, there's the mother, and we know that. We aren't going to compete with that, nor do we want to. But when the boy is 18, right? so there, I call these long seasons, and suddenly you want that son mm -hmm. turning to his dad. And it used to be Johnson and son. Johnson, mm -hmm. you know, Davison. It was always the, the, the David's sons and wow. John's wow. sons on the side. It was always the William son. It's the yeah. carpentry, uh, the sons. Yeah. And we've lost that. Wow. And later in life, the father figure toward the sons becomes fundamental. And the father figure toward the adult daughter, her whole self. And she, the, the, what all these movies now have removed many of these movies of the uh, thrillers mm -hmm. where there's the chase. If you've noticed what they're doing, the, the, the hero is not married, either the, the wife divorced or she's dead. Mm -hmm. But they've introduced the daughter because it removes that need for the romantic script that is too complicated. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of time and energy for the husband-wife relationship. But you have the daughter being rescued by the father. If you're tracking, this is a constant theme. And I mm -hmm. say, it hit me. Well, what's going on? They tapped into the longing of every daughter's heart. Like taken with a Liam Neeson. That's the, that's yes. exactly. Yes. Wow. That's exactly right. right. Everyone loves it. Yeah. Love that. That's right. Yeah. And they've I've got a how, special set of skills. I'm coming after you. Well, the point is it, it appeals both to men and women. Mm -hmm. But what's the appeal on the women? Probably they're getting these younger girls, mm -hmm. the, the daughter longing for the father. Mm -hmm. And so I say to mothers, there's going to come a point. Don't, don't, don't chop him off at the knees. Unless he's doing evil, let's just work with each other because the role that he has is extremely significant. And if you show him nothing but contempt, you're undermining 
her self-image mm. at some point. Mm. And she might not even realize it. Not at this point mm. and maybe never. But I've had women write me and said, nobody respected men in my family. My aunts didn't. My grandmother didn't. My m- sisters didn't. My mother didn't. Everybody showed contempt. Mm. And, um, and that's not a good thing mm-hmm. because it does create this inner insecurity. We need that male strength just as we need the female care and love. Mm. And uh, I say to men in the church, look, I'm going to say something to you. When you get sick and you have a very serious illness, it's going to spread across America to the prayer meeting groups. And those are women prayer meetings. Hundreds of women are going to be praying for you by name because they care. They don't even know you, but they're going to be praying for you. This is the gift that God's given to us that you're going to be, the men are going to be going through business. They're not, you know, right, right. I think, what do you mean? I think Matt's got something, right. but the one is what? Oh, how is Sheena doing? How are the kids doing? What, what, what are the doctors saying? It's just a beautiful thing. And men don't appreciate it until they get sick. Yeah. Wow. Well, Dr. Emerson, I appreciate you just gracing our stage, our presence, our podcast. To ask one last thing. Please. Would you end this conversation with a prayer? Sure. And, and specifically, I want to pray for, for men um, that are being attacked in this, in this day and age, I want to pray for our women the same to thanks him too as well, because there's so much, you know, lack of focus and different trajectories and different understandings in the healing of America, the healing of our families, the healing of our communities. If you can pray to that. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I pastor for 20 years, so this will be a pastoral prayer. Is that okay? I mean that. Okay. All right. Good. Lord, we thank you for Matt and Sheena yes, and just God. their thank you, desire to do marriage well themselves and their love of so many who are associated with them and just how they are seeking to inspire and inform. And I pray that you'd continue to honor those efforts. But on this deeper issue of relationships, whether it's um, husband, wife, or maybe mother, son, or daughter toward father, we pray that those who are watching, you know, um, some are wounded. Uh, Some are, um, they have a hole. I understand that. And I pray that you would... um, take this information and just remind them to kind of maybe recalibrate yes, and to trust Christ that he knew what he was saying. He revealed truth that we are not um, just on some kind of a uh, uncertainty here in the middle of a storm and just being um, knocked back and forth, that there is a, an anchor, there is truth, there is a wise way of, of living. And it just leads to an inner contentment and peace and happiness long term. And I pray then that this individual who's maybe been listening to voices that are sincere and who are caring, but may not be wise and may be misleading. And I pray that you would uh, allow them to receive from, from Matt and Sheena, that they would trust them, that they are transparent, but they are also uh, very excited about principles, about truth, and about what just works yes. and ultimately leads to a life well lived without loneliness, without uh, envy and jealousy, and just having that inner sense of peace and having a sense of identity and uh, just basically being happy. And so we commit this person to you. You know their background. You know their needs. I don't know what they're going through, but may they be like me. I wasn't raised a Christian, didn't know, but may they have a, a holy curiosity about some of these things if in days past they've kind of push that off because of academia and the dismissive attitude that's out there, that they would reconsider and uh, not give in to some of those voices for their own sake. Through Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, you guys, if you've been watching this, make sure you share this with your friend, your family member, your husband, your wife. Make sure you follow Dr. Emerson Edgar's work. We'll put all the links in the description section below. So that being said, please put your biggest takeaway. Matter of fact, we might have some books to send our way to your home. If you put, we should put here, love and respect. Yeah. Put love and respect in the comment section below. If you watch this interview all the way to the end, we'll pick a random person to receive a copy of Dr. Emerson Egridge's book, Love and Respect. That being said, from San Antonio, Texas, I'm your money smart guy on behalf of my wifey, this entire event, till we meet again. Continue to love smart. Continue to love smart. And be money smart today.